All right. Um, and Lucy and Johnny, I think that the three of us, uh, the reason why I invited Johnny and, and Lucy to take part is to, because we're all basically going through this um, querying process or approaching it. Um, and Laura, it's brilliant to have you with us. So why don't we start off with a bit of introductions? Um, Lucy, do you want to introduce yourself first? Sure, yeah. So I'm Lucy McLaren. Um, I'm a fantasy author. Um, my debut, Awakening, The Commune's Curse, book one, came out in May last year from Santa Fe Writers Project. Um, but yeah, I'm an unagented author, so I'm very interested in um, getting Laura's tips and advice on the querying process, which I'm hoping to be approaching towards the end of this year. There you go. Johnny? Hey everyone, great to be back with you, Richie and everyone. Um, I am currently writing an epic second world science fan fantasy that I'm getting ready to query to literary agents probably in the new year once I finish with my critique group and get through a good round of edits on everything. So yeah, I'm just excited to be here and uh, get some insights and hopefully, you know, share some for us writers as well because it's a, it's an intimidating thing and oh, uh, yeah. it's great to to be here with everybody to support each other in that process. So thanks for having Definitely. me. Oh, thanks for joining us. And Laura, thank you very much. You want to introduce yourself? That's so awkward bit, isn't it? Um, <laughs> hello, I'm Laura. Um, I'm an agent at the Liverpool Literary Agency. We're still quite new. Um, the agency has been going for about three years now. And I've been an agent for about a year and a half. Yeah, yeah, nearly last year. Um, and I only represent science fiction fantasy. So. Don't ask me things about anything outside of that. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Um, it's brilliant to have you here because like Johnny just said there, it, it is a little bit intimidating. Um, I, I've been, I, I've worked with the indie press before, but I've never sort of approached an agent and I'm just finished my novel now and I'm going through this process. I have loads of questions and um, a lot of imposter syndrome, <laughs> but you've got to go into it with a bit of... Um, sort of bravado and a bit of a fucking attitude haven't you so <laughs> could you um i think a good place to start because a lot of people just send us questions about um like what it's like the time frames that are involved and i think that all comes in we can all be explained by uh, a bit of an idea of what it's like to be an agent and what you're up against um so do you fancy telling us a bit about that to start yeah yeah <laughs> so like I was saying before you have to take my experience with a little bit of a grain of salt because my way of approaching things and the way that I am is very different to what most agents are going to be because most agents are probably down in London and they have an office and they're with a big agent you know a big agency um my agency is literally two of us and I work from home and my full-time job is looking after my two-year-old so mm. she was two on Friday <laughs> oh, happy birthday. she's uh yeah i've had a very busy weekend so <laughs> i is anyone who has kids will appreciate the fact that my day is spent looking after the two-year-old and then agenting kind of fits in around that yeah um and i read some you know from from what i've spoken to other agents it takes about five years to build up a career as an agent so any agent who is either not a big agency or is just starting their career probably either has another job or a side gig or multiple side gigs yeah um which is why you'll see sometimes agents offering editing services or um things like that i mean you have to be careful with those because some agents are shady with it and we can talk about that another time if you want to <laughs> um but that's why because agenting because we only get paid on commission yeah um it takes a long time to build it up because if you think about the fact that everything's years in advance so if I sell a book today it's going to come out in a year a year and a half so I'm going to see no money from it until you know whenever yeah. the first if, if there's an advance when the first bit of the advance comes through or if there's no advance whenever the book comes out so it's a hard career to get into unless you've got some way of supporting yourself already yeah. um of course starting at big agencies I think some of them probably get a salary um, but I know some agents that are at agencies that don't, they just get commission. Um, so there's that. Um, there's a lot of reading. <laughs> a lot of reading. Yeah. Um, and once you build up a client list, so I have 15 clients now. And mostly they produce maybe a book a year. 
So that's roughly a book a month that I'm needing to read for each of my clients um, and do a first pass of editing and then work on the pitch for that and then get it out to editors. Um, I'm having meetings with editors. I'm looking at contracts. Um, so the kind of the more successful you are as an agent, the more work you have, right? Yeah. Um, although once you get a client under contract, it's nice because then they're just working away on their book. And it's great if they get like a two book contract because then they can work away on the two books and they just kind of over there doing their thing. <laughs> um, but I also act as a bit of a therapist and a bit of an agony aunt and support. My, I'm, I'm a very involved agent, so I chat to my authors quite a lot. Um, I have a, a, a Discord um, server just for my authors. So we all talk about, you know, what they're working on and if they've got any issues and they, they can contact me whenever sort of thing. Um, I don't, I think some agents probably aren't quite as hands-on as that, but um, I was explaining this to one of the editors I talked to recently because I've grown up being in internet communities. So I've grown up being, um, you know, I played Star Wars Galaxies and then I played World of Warcraft and then I played Knights of the Old Republic and ran a guild. So I'm very used to that online yeah world and talking a lot to people online and having a relationship with people online so to me that's very natural to be chatting to somebody on twitter or discord or whatever yeah um and i'm very much i i like to be approachable like um one of my authors she tweeted something about how now i get to see her being unhinged in emails and she puts lots of exclamation points <laughs> because she's not agonizing over every email that she sends me anymore um, which is how I prefer it to be. Like I'd rather they like sent me fifty Discord messages with a million uh, exclamation marks <laughs> rather than be worried about what they were saying. Um, does that answer the question? <laughs> I kind of get on a ramble about something. <laughs> no, yeah, I think basically you get an idea of what it's like. You've got an awful lot of work to do and not a lot of time to do it. <laughs> and I think that's going um, to be why it like people are concerned when you see like oh there's a six month turnaround time for, like a the other side of that as well is we yeah. have that as well so i've sent yeah. out submissions to editors and um the shortest time is generally a month two months i've got books that have been out for a year and i still haven't got an answer from people so yeah. it's it's a backlog as well so if i've got a book out on submission and i get a similar book i literally can't take it because then i would be in competition with the book that i already have out ah. uh, even if that book's been out for six months yeah, um, I think that's uh, it's a, it takes us nicely onto querying because this is where I think about 80% of the questions that we received was all about how to query an agent and what kind of things do agent, what like, uh, agents like. So, Johnny, I think you had some really good questions about uh, the querying process. Do you want to? Yeah, us I think something definitely that I've, well, I just have done a lot of research and listened to several podcasts where they talk to a lot of different agents and just kind of humanizing them and like, don't be scared of agents. You're trying to find somebody to build a relationship with. So how do you um, suggest, you know, what are some things that really stand out to you in the, you know, either good or bad inquiries that you see, like maybe some of the pitfalls that people tend to fall into, or, you know, you just talked about one of your authors being more casual and like being able to show themselves in in that but obviously you know you want to do that in your query and show them that but you know you guys are humans too so just kind of taking down that barrier but what are some things that you really like um when you see a good query um i like i mean with a query you want the agent to be able to get an idea of what is there quickly so i like to have this is how I always kind of suggest, and if um, I'll send you a link later that I, I did like um, a blog sort of post on how to write a query letter on our website. So I'll, oh, I'll find that for you guys at some point. But it's I like I like to have like what I call the marketing information first, which is what genre is it, what age is it, um, how many words is it, and uh, what are the themes, um, just quickly, and maybe your, your comp titles. Um, so you know, this is a hundred and ten thousand word adult fantasy that has themes of loss and betrayal uh, and it's similar to uh, Neil Gaiman, Brandon Sanderson, something, something like that in your first quick thing. Because then when I'm having to look through emails quickly, I can go, okay, that's too long or I don't do that genre or, you know, that kind yeah. of thing. And unfortunately, it sounds very cold, but sometimes there are things that you just have to do and reject, 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 because it's not my genre. Well, it's, 
And that's important too for people because it's not personal. Like it's in the, in, they're never going to understand what your reasoning is, right? Because you might just have a book that's similar to on your list. So just not taking that rejection personally. Oh, yeah. It doesn't yeah, mean yeah. your work is bad. I think that's something good as authors to remember because, you know, you probably don't know what the reasoning is behind it. So, so you know, you can't. And the thing is, it's all very subjective as well. And what I, what I don't get gripped by, someone else could find amazing. Like, yeah. It, that's why it can be and that kind of is why to go off, off another tangent that's sometimes why we don't give feedback because sometimes the feedback is so subjective it wouldn't help the author because it's literally yeah. just this isn't quite for me and yeah. I can't put my finger on why <laughs> like without it you know there's no point in me giving feedback that would then lead to a change when it's subjectively good it's just also, I think it's good for us as writers to remember that this is all free work that you guys are doing. Like you're not getting paid for any of this. So expecting a personalized response with like query feedback, it probably isn't, you know, if, if you get that, that's amazing. It means they care that that's actually a good sign that there was something about it that probably spoke to it because otherwise you just, you don't have time to do it. I'm sure with everything that's in your your slush pile waiting to be read yeah no. <laughs> I always try and give feedback on any fulls that I get because I think when you for me if I ask for a full and then agreeing to read at least you know the first quarter if not more and yeah. give some kind of feedback um I wouldn't you know I don't I don't ghost on fulls um I think some people do unfortunately but and unfortunately I've been you've requested of them right yeah like I'm really yeah. slow right now <laughs> I've got like three fulls in my inbox that are staring at me every time I open my inbox um <laughs> because I've just had a load of client work come up and toddler and everything and um but I will get to them and I will give them some feedback and you know um but I, I've been really stingy about asking for fulls this time around um because when I first opened for um queries I asked for too many fulls and just couldn't get through them all whereas now I've been really like has yeah. to really grab me um yeah so like marketing information um a good blurb you want a good blurb that tells you um the character the challenges a little bit about the world the kind of thing you'd have on the back of the book right and then um an author bio i like to know why the author has written this book why this person has written this book yeah. what what do you connect with in the book um tell me that yeah. Like, and I like to know a little bit about the person, you know, what it doesn't have to be loads, but maybe maybe what job you do, maybe a little bit about your background, um, that kind of thing. I suppose it's a partnership, isn't it? You wanna learn about that person as much as about the book. Yeah. Like, be able to work with each other. Yeah. Lucy, have you got any questions on query? Uh I think well, you've already covered basically what would be an instant yes or no. I think it sounds like it's quite um instinctual for you like when you read something you know whether it's going to be a, a possible yes or like an instant no um, I was I, I remember reading about um writing trends and people following those versus writing the story they want to and I don't know whether this is more personal to agents but whether you could comment on how important writing trends are like following trends whether that's even possible because like you said the publishing process is so slow that by the time a book actually comes out that trend may have passed um but yeah is that something that you look for at all when you're when you get queries in um what I usually have in mind is can I sell this so and that's made up of a few different things it's is the writing solid am I passionate about this book and do I have any editors in mind for it so it's really good so at the moment fantasy romance is like massive so if I get a fantasy romance in that then fulfills other other criteria, I'm very, you know, I'm get excited about it. Um, but I would never ever recommend writing to trend because if it takes you a year or two to write a book, chances are the trend will have gone. Um there's there's lots of trends that are timeless, so space opera, epic fantasy. Um, everything comes back around, like dystopian had gone out and now it's coming back in. Um, urban fantasy had gone out and then it's kind of not great now but I think it's going to come back in I think everything comes around I think be prepared to shelve a book and work on something else if you're getting lots of form responses or it's not on trend but don't write to trend does that make sense so mm. 
be prepared for to be told, listen, this just isn't selling right now. Yeah. Um, but don't try and write something that's on trend because by the time you've written it, by the time you've edited it, and by the time you've got it in front of someone, and by the time it's getting in front of anyone else, you know, it's we have to yeah. kind of get the crystal ball out as agents and, <laughs> and you know predict what's going to be, mm. you know. Uh, and I get a lot because I get a lot of my, my information when I'm talking to editors, so I have quite um, frequent meetings with editors, and I have catch up meetings with editors and say, okay, what are you looking for at the moment? And find that out and then yeah kind of go from there so and when I'm looking through queries and things I kind of have in the back of my head okay what's big right now but I also think what could be big yeah what what's just so good that it doesn't matter if it's not big right now yeah you know what you know I've got and I think editors are looking for the next big thing as well and that's that's one problem with traditional publishing with big publishers is they need to be ready to embrace something that isn't big right now but they could help make it big yeah. And I think that's happened. I think that's happened with um, Iron Widow. It happened with Legends and Lattes. It happened with uh, the Book Eaters. None of those were like on trend. You know, yeah. Legends and Lattes has made cozy fantasy go whoop. You know? <laughs> yeah. um, it just, it, you know. <laughs> don't, don't, don't write to trend, but you can't ignore the market. But also, yes. <laughs> like, it has to be the book. It has to be the story that you want to tell, right? Because if yeah. you're not passionate about it, you're going to write a crap book, aren't you? You know? <laughs> no. I don't know how you could write 100,000 words. It's something that you went into as well. Yeah. Well, when you said fantasy romance, I was like, God, no, I could never write that. Like, is this not my thing? It makes me want to cringe and, like, like, implode yeah. on the spot. I just can't write that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I think it probably would come across in a writer's voice if they're trying to yeah. force something that's not right for them. Yeah. yeah. And there's there's loads of stuff that's, that's you know, people are looking for um, parent-child relationships. They're looking for, um, you know, because The Last of Us has taken off. There's people are looking for sibling relations. People are looking for, um, I want to see all of the LGBTQ spectrum. So I want to see some ace people. I want to see some a romantic people. You know, you, you want to have all of it. Um, yeah. So that's great news for my story. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I did sort of have a specific question that I'm dealing with that I've kind of like would love a little perspective on. So like mine's going to be a long series, right? But I know that if you put in your book that it's like, hi, I have nine books. Like it's just mm -hmm. hard to sell. Like it's impossible <laughs> to sell to anybody. But then they want these big things. Do you know what I mean? It's sort of a, a we would say a catch 22. Like you, you can't win one because it's like they want these epic series that they could turn into television shows and movies and video games and make all that sub rights money and IP money on, but they, they don't want to pick it up at the beginning, you know, at, which I, <laughs> I get, you know, it's like a risk reward thing. So how do you do that? Like, it's not going to change what I'm writing. It just means it's going to be harder for me to find the right agent for it and the right so publisher. So I've had this come up. So I do, I do um, agent one-to-ones where people basically pay to come and chat to me and whatever. And I don't put to, this is, this has come up a lot. Because what the two most common things that comes up in fantasy and sci-fi is series and massive chonky books, <laughs> and they're two things that aren't selling right now. Um, with a series, my advice is either make the first one a, what we call a standalone with series potential. Yeah. So make the first one able to stand on its own with an ending, but the potential to carry on. Or go away and write another book, <laughs> sell that. And then sell your big epic nine book series once you've got a foot in the door. Um both things are hard and you know You could package a trilogy though, right? Like that's kind of a middle ground between that. Like you could do all at the moment, duologies are the big thing. Okay. Because a two you're much more likely to get like a two book deal than a three book deal. And you're more likely to get yeah. it's really hard to get a three book or above deal right now i think from a business perspective as well i think adrian shaikoff she said it doesn't matter who you are unless you're probably brandon sanderson like a, <laughs> a, a series of books the readership is just going to drop and drop and drop yeah so the longer the series it just seems like a bit of a you're not going to make any money on it yeah well one of the um editors gave me a good thing which was they like a series that is connected books so like uh discworld where they're all yeah you can start anywhere in the series like a shared universe kind yeah of like a shared yeah. universe that's one I way to that do idea. it yeah, um, because you can because if you walk into a bookshop and they've got book four but not book two but it doesn't matter because you can start anywhere you, you'll pick it up whereas if you yeah. go into a bookshop and they've only got book four and none of the others you're going to be like 
Nice. You know, Keep or flexible. yes, I'll go to Amazon. Well, you know, whatever. Um, yeah. So once you once you get a foot in the door and you're established, then you know you get the big the big series. Yeah. Um, if you lay Bardugo with your ten million pound book deal, you know it's uh, <laughs> <laughs> it is it's like really hard. It's hard yeah, it's to a, sell a series right now. It's I don't mind, I don't mind an upstream swim. So maybe that's <laughs> punishment, but. You mentioned the yeah. uh, workouts there, Laura. I was wondering what is a sort of, especially for like new authors, what kind of, what is a, a good word count for people to sort of keep in mind? Um, so keep in mind, I only do YA and adult. So YA, you don't want to go too much, depending on the, so you can have like teen YA. I wouldn't go above about 80 to 90,000. If it's yeah. kind of in the crossover space, you're looking at about 100,000. And then adult, for me, once you get to 120, if you go over that, I'll start going, hmm. Yeah. Um, I was once quoted this by an editor that 140 was their cutoff point because after 140, it got too expensive to print. Yeah. So they wouldn't really take on debut authors over 140 because then the cost to, you know, ratios just got completely yeah. like they couldn't do it. Would that um, come down now? Do you think that like all printing costs have gone off? Well, possibly, yeah. Um, and even even for ebooks as well, because it's the editing time as well. Because if you've got an editor, they can edit two eighty thousand word books in the space of time. You know, yeah. uh, urban fantasy, yeah. I mean, because space opera and epic fantasy need so much world building, and you can get away with more. But yeah. if it's like our world with a twist, then a little bit less, I would say. Nice. Um, like, like I said, one hundred and twenty thousand is a, a sweet spot for me. Like that, that's you know. Long enough to get the world building in, but not so long that it's too long. Yeah. Um, but anywhere from like ninety to one hundred and twenty is good, like a yes. good amount. Um, Lucy, you had a great question about um, including something in a query letter about um, you sort of publishing history. Yeah. Um, so I was going to ask whether it makes any difference whatsoever if an author is already published. So it's probably, I mean, obviously personal to me, but I, I don't know other people here are published, whether that be through self-publishing or through small press like myself. So does it make a difference to an agent um, if you put that in the query letter that, you know, you, you've already got a book out there? Does that mean much at all? Um, it does because it shows that you've been through that process and that ed and the editing and the, you know, um, Unless you're getting big numbers and big sales, it's probably not going to do much in terms of selling you to a big publisher. Mm. But it does, for me, if I see someone who's been published before, it kind of says to me, okay, they've been through that process. They can work with an editor. It, as for a small batch, you can work with an editor. Um, you can take, you know, it's good to know that you're experienced in being critiqued and having that feedback and working on it and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, and, it, you know, and small presses, are great you know they're not going to take on someone who they don't believe in um so it shows that your writing quality is there um yeah it, it, it's a good thing to put in your in your query letter um okay. and if you get you know if you're getting decent if your if your book's got a few hundred reviews and four stars put that in because that's great you know yeah that's it's brilliant as a, as a as a writer with a small press or self-published that's really good so yeah. pop that in you know that's I suppose um, it's a bit of proof, isn't it? Like that yeah. people like what you you create. So it could be a could sway things sometimes. Yeah, and I know some um, some traditional publishers, the big publishers, obviously take will take self published things and then publish them. So like with um, T J yeah. Clue and his stuff, they went back and got his self published stuff and published it. You know. Yeah, so. we uh, we were chatting with uh, a few Angry Robots authors, and one of them, um, Stacey McEwen. She was about to self-publish her book. I can't remember, it's called Chasm or something like that. And um, because she had such a huge TikTok following and the pre-order sales were so big for that book, Angry Robot just signed her up on the back mm. of that. So it, it does, like, if you can prove it. Like I say, it's business, isn't it? And if there's a chance that they can make money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, because is that yeah. important too, Laura, like social media um, presence for your authors? Um, I don't mind. Like if someone comes to me and they're like not on social media, it doesn't bother me. Um, because the impact you have kind of as a single person is so small compared to the impact that you would have with a big publisher. It, it's good to know. It's, it's definitely, um, 
a selling point if someone is on social media and has a decent amount of followers and that sort of stuff because the publisher will want to sort of know a little bit about it and they'll want to work with you on that but yeah. you don't have to have like 200,000 followers or something for I saw something oh was it going there was something going around about an agent saying that people had to have a certain amount of followers and I was like what a load of politics yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> thinking that maybe it might make their job a bit easier because they don't have to promote yeah. it as much <laughs> but I mean the thing is and I you know writing a book the skills you need to write a book are so different to the skills you need to write a query letter or to go on social media or to it's it's like for me personally even if I get a terrible query letter through I still look at the sample pages because I could just have someone who is an amazing yeah. fiction writer who can't market their book yeah and that you know i can work on that you know i if i get someone yeah. who's written an amazing novel i can work on the rest of it you know yeah i think a lot of writers should take like a deep breath when it comes to querying too like i've heard so many agents say similar things when they're being interviewed like one agent even offered to a writer who put the wrong name in the query letter like they called her a completely different agent it happens because like you you know that like it's querying is hard and that it's the actual book that matters but... i once i once left in i once left in dear editor on an <laughs> and then i email them back going oh my god <laughs> yeah so... like you're not gonna reject something for a misplaced comma or, or a typo or anything like that so yeah i've i've heard that too and it's good just to like <laughs> give yourself a little grace and and don't you know about that yeah. I mean, Stuff you want it's... your query letter to be the best that you can make it. But yeah. Don't worry too much. And I don't try and personalize it too much either. Because if you're kind of combing through the their Twitter and their manuscript wish list and trying to completely personalize it, they're probably not going to read it. Like, to be honest. Yeah. In, in a Unless way. it's really authentic for you. Like, yeah. you really do. If like, it really if is. You've, yeah. If you've met them or they've asked they've liked something that you've posted or you've had some kind of personal contact with them put that in but if you've never interacted with them before you can tell that someone's read your manuscript wish list by what they're sending you you can yeah. you know if they said if, if someone sent me crime i'd be like they've obviously not read my wish list goodbye like and i'm not sure just in case any everyone doesn't know manuscript wish list is a website where you can actually look up literary agents it shows what they're currently looking for if they're open for submissions and you can you can book time and stuff right like for consultations and query reviews i think so i think so i think so. not I mean, to I... plug something else but it is a really great tool and i don't know of anything else like it for that authors can access to like yeah, yeah and quite sure. often um yeah. agents will post the link to it on their twitter and things like that and so you can you can tell you can tell that you've done your research because you're sending something that we're interested in so don't worry about saying i saw on your manuscript which is that you're looking for x y and z don't, don't worry about it because we can tell we can tell that you've done the research yeah and that sounds like like i say it's a brilliant resource for anyone who's so would you be able to use that to find agents who are got like calls for submissions on at the moment and stuff like that i think so i think you can Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah, I think but, they put out like a newsletter that when they're like who's open for submissions, there's different like levels and different things that you can do. Um, oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. It's nice. A, it's a really well, great uh, What is it? Uh, Manuscriptwishlist.com? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Very good. I'll put the link in the description for that as well because that uh, sounds great. I had a little question here, Laura, about things like short story publications and anthologies. Um, would that be included in a, a query for a novel do you think yeah i'd put it in because it shows that you've got again it shows that you've got that experience of of getting out there and getting your work published yeah and another question just on query and, uh, and genres would you be interested in like genre mashups is that the kind of thing that people are looking out for like you mm. need twists on things a lot of the editors i've spoken to recently have said they like things that cross genre nice um, there we go so um I know science thrillers aren't very popular right now. Um, that was the only, that's the only one that's really hard to sell at the moment. Um, yeah. we'll but things like scientists. <laughs> horror is really big right now. So fantasy horror, science horror, anything that crosses over into horror is um, is a big thing right now. Because horror, it looks like horror is going to have a bit of a... But oh, yeah, nice. anything, anything that yeah, crosses over is fine. Yeah. <laughs> 
Cool. Something I wanted to ask you about was the synopsis, because this is something that you usually have to include with the submission. So, I mean, this, me and Johnny were just debating like all the different sort of definitions of what a synopsis is. Is it a summary of your story? Is it just a sort of a, an overview of like the character and the theme and stuff like that? Maybe, what was your insight on the synopsis? So, the synopsis is a very factual, very cold, very um, stripped back version of your plot. Yeah. Um, one one tip I always give is write your synopsis as you go along. Every time you finish writing a chapter, write a couple of sentences about what happens in that chapter. Okay. And do that as you go along, because that will help. Because if you get all the way to the end of your book and you go, oh, crikey, now I've got to write a synopsis. It's <laughs> horrendous. <laughs> well, for, it's, it's amazing to me that you can write a book and then suddenly be like what is that about what did I just write yeah. so I'm, I'm, ta- I'm writing that tip down right now that is amazing it's a what tip. kind of length um, is, is, is the kind of length do you look for in a synopsis sorry what Say length. Like how long should it be um, between a page and two pages okay. um, about depending on how long your book is and how many twists there are in the in the plot it's like a simple one you can because you'll see some people say i want a one-page synopsis um to just be just check the guide like yeah always check the guidelines you know um but sorry and so the synopsis should have all of your plot twists all of the major spoil everything spoiler everything a (laughs) summary everything a summary should avoid that and kind of be similar to what you would see on a book text but a little bit more in so you in your in your query letter that is exactly. the blurb that you would see on the back of the book. And that yeah. is the place to get in your themes and your inspirations and your comp titles and everything else. Your, synop- your synopsis is the factual, this happens, this happens, this happens, this happens. Just really, you know, boom, 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 boom. This this is what happens. Um, I always say when you bring a character into your synopsis, write their name in capital letters. Yeah. And tell us their ages as well, if, if that's relevant. Um, because then when we're reading the synopsis, we can see where a character comes in for the first time very easily. Yeah. And it just makes it a little bit easier to read for for us. Um, yeah, because your blurb in the query letter, you shouldn't really mention more than maybe one or two characters. Yeah. And then your synopsis, you can mention like all the main characters. Nice. So what would you say for a blurb? Then that's more of like a general overview. That's your... That's your, your um, like you said, what you see on the back of the book. Yeah. Um, so that's, you know, uh, what, what have I got lying around here? Um, I've heard a good formula to use while you yeah, look. Yeah. is yeah. like character wants X, but can't because of Y. Yeah. And therefore Z happens. Like yeah. that's kind of a good basic yeah. formula. Yeah. To use. And that shouldn't yeah. be more than two or three paragraphs. Nice. Um, yeah, synopsis put in spoilers, blurb, no spoilers. Yeah. The blurb is, imagine someone is picking up the book and reading the back of the book. So if you spoil your twist, they'll be like, I'm not reading that, man. <laughs> yeah. Like watching yeah, the trailer for a spoil. film, no? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, synopsis, yeah. spoil all the things. Tell us everything. Tell us what happens to every single, you know, all the important characters. Tell us what happens in the end. Nice. That's really good stuff. Um, we mentioned a couple of things there. Um, manuscript wish list and someone's just mentioned query manager as well are there any other good tips you've got for finding an agent or seeing who's looking for submissions uh it used to be go on twitter but twitter kind of has gone now um (laughs) there is there are still a lot of agents and editors on twitter there's still like quite a lot of us using it um there's is it publishers marketplace let me double check that yeah, I think um, that's correct. Yeah, Publishers Marketplace. So you do have to pay to get like the premium stuff, but I think you can get so much of it free and that you can look up editors and agents and you can see what deals are being made and things like that. Oh, cool. Um, so when it might be, if, if you can afford it and if you want to, it might be worth signing up to it for the minimum time. And then yeah. you can literally search by deal makers. You can put in like fantasy top deals and you can see which agents are sold to editors. And then that can give you an idea of which agents are currently accepted in the genres that you're doing um, and things like that. Um, 
UK agents don't use it as much as US ones. US publishers tend to use it more. Um, there's the bookseller as well. Um, but again, that's a paid subscription because everything's paid. Um, yeah. I think you can get like so many articles a month for free. So you can look at what rights are being sold. Yeah. Um, so look for like similar things to yours and that'll give you an idea of what agents to go for. Oh, cool. You mentioned the US there. I mean, if you queried an agent in the US, would they cover you for UK markets as well? Because I've yeah. seen a few um, people who've got like agents for different countries and stuff like that. Yeah. 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 Um, so we tend to sell, so we, big, big agencies have people in-house that do like translation rights and TV and film rights. We have like partnerships with other other people that do it. But um, it's generally, you know, you sell, you sell world rights. Um, it doesn't really matter where you are, like, anymore. It used to. Um, yeah. But nowadays, thankfully, everything's kind of gone online. And um doesn't really matter where you are. Well, one of my writers is in Germany, another one's in America. So, um, yeah, It doesn't really matter. It's like a global in the industry now, isn't it? Yeah. I think, I think most agents are either in the UK or the US. Maybe some in Canada and Australia. But I think quite a lot are in because of the way the publishing industry works in these countries this is where the big publishers are so yeah we've had a question here um do you think it's worthwhile querying agents in your country or um people based in other countries do you, or does it not matter like i don't saying? think it matters i think i mean it's nice to have one in your country because you're more likely to be able to see them in person and um i think as well it depends on your your, your voice as well because i have some of my authors have got quite English voices in their work, if that makes sense. Like their, their books are set in England, their characters are English. Yeah. You know, I'm probably going to go to a UK publisher first because it's a, you know, that kind of book. Yeah. So if you've written quite a a local book, does that make sense? If you've written like a, you know, you're more likely to get an, an Asian who gets that. Like, yeah. You know. I think uh, another question that a lot of people have asked is about the kind of terms that you would strike up with an agent. And I think when we had a chat about this on our, on the podcast, there was uh, something that I didn't know about, which I found really interesting, is that when you um, work with an agent, is it just for a particular book that they get a percentage of the sales relating to that book, but not, like, say, if you self-published another book, you wouldn't, that would be tr treated as, like, a separate thing um, so could you tell us a bit about like how contracts and agreements are, are usually structured? Yeah. So um, it's basically what we sell, we get a percentage of. Yeah. So if you go away and self-publish a book that we have nothing to do with, we don't, we don't get anything. We don't touch that. Um, I know some, some of our writers self-publish as well. They tend to do it under a different name just so it's not kind of um, confusing the, the waters or they'll like yeah. um, publish you know, they might publish, um, self-publish crime and they've gone out on submission with a fantasy. Um, cause it's just a bit of money, isn't it? Cause you know, writing's hard to make yeah. a, a livable career. So if you can go and self-publish a few, say a quick books, I don't want to, cause self-publishing is hard, but you might, you know, you can do something that's a bit, um, off trend or you can bash out like, you know, a romance that's only 50,000 words long or whatever, you know, something short, um, or novellas or, you know, something that you can sell for yeah, whatever. Um, while you're on submission for a year, you know, yeah. it's a bit of money, a bit of money coming in. Definitely, um, yeah. And we wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't touch that. Nice. What kind of a percentage do you usually negotiate or does it vary? I'm going to get this wrong if I do it from memory. I think it's 15% for... I'm going to look at the contract and have a look, and I will tell you exactly what it is. Yeah. I've heard fifteen percent is pretty standard. Yeah. In the industry. Yeah, off the top of my head, that's what it is. But I will actually take the time to get the contract up <laughs> and tell you for certain. Um, is there anything? I it, well, while we're on contracts, I know somebody in my writing group had a question. I think it was Tyler about um, if there's anything that people should look out for that may be predatory in the industry, like from a writer's writer agent contract like what are some of those things to people for people to be aware of okay let me thing. let me Sorry, answer the percentage one and then i will absolutely bang on about that um okay so for uk 15 percent outside uk 20 percent 
radio, television, film, 20%. So it's 15 to 20%, depending on what it is. Yeah. And I think that's pretty standard. Nice. Um, and of that, quite often, the individual agent will then get a percentage of that and the agency will get a percentage of it. I see. Because so the actual, like commission the, and then... Yeah, because the agency has to pay for the website, the email, the um, events, the everything else. Like the agency has overheads and then... Yeah, so um, yes, so predatory. So one of the big things I would look out for is any agents who offer paid editorial services. Um, I think I mentioned it earlier, it can be like an alternate revenue stream on the side for agents, but you want to look out for ones who basically cross the streams. So if you queried an agent and they said, no, I'm not going to accept you, but you could pay me to edit your book, just, just run, just go, because that's predatory. That's... Uh, or kind of making it sound like if they edit it, they would then take it on yeah. if you pay them. Mm -mm. No way. No, no. Um, we do ours through other companies, other companies, basically. Um, and if I was going to do any editing work, I would make sure it was ironclad in terms of not crossing over with my agenting. Yeah. Um, so that's look out for. Um, anything else to look out for? I know because some you want to look, you have to look out for like um, if any small press basically says they want all the rights ever. Um, look out for that. So if you're offered a contract by a small press, make sure you're happy with the percentages and keep back the rights that you don't want to sell. So you want to keep back like TV and film rights. Um, yeah. If they don't have. Um, a way of producing the audio, keep back the audio rights. If they don't have a way of translating, keep back the translation rights because you can then go and sell those somewhere else. Because like some people who get self-published and do really well, then go and go to an agent and say, hey, can you sell the translation rights for me? Or yeah. hey, can you sell the audio rights for me? Or hey, can you sell the paperback? You know, keep hold of the rights that you can. Um, yeah. If any publisher says, no, we want all the rights forever, that's generally not not great. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Lucy, that's a, a great recommendation you just posted in the in the chat. Do you want to tell us a bit about that? Yeah, so the Right of Beware website is really good for um, keeping up to date with dodgy uh, publishers, schmagents as they call them, um, hybrid <laughs> publishers. You know, I think uh, uh, basically the, the the main thing I see is anyone that tries to charge you upfront for stuff is generally yeah <laughs> yeah money money should flow from the publisher to the writer yeah not the other way around you know if they approach you and say well you just have to pay 50 percent of the costs to no yeah that's the get into like vanity presses then no well, it's a shame oh, it's, oh you can see why these places have, have sort of cropped up because it's these people like are writing books and it's the dream to get published and to see it on the shelves and it's just preying on on them sort yeah. of hopes. I mean, my advice would be if if you say say you approach a publisher and they say, right, you've got to pay us five grand and we'll publish your book, go and self-publish it because you can spend that money on self-publishing it and then you control it and you own it. Yeah. It's a lot so more if you if you have the money to spend on publishing your book, self-publish it because you know, pay pay for pay an editor, pay yeah. you know three grand of that for an editor, so many hundred for an artist, you know. And if you are able to afford it, it's not a bad idea to, you know, utilize those services and, and pay for an agent to review your query letter. It's great to get somebody who does it every day to give you that feedback and that's something you're seeking out. So I wouldn't be wary of, of those things, um, of investing in that, if that's something you're really serious about. I, this, I think um, the two companies yeah. we use are Jericho Writers and I'm in print, and they're both very good. They have all kinds of paid services for writers. Awesome. Oh. And they're, they're both legit and very nice people. So Yeah, I've heard of Jericho Writers, they've got a yeah. great name. And do they do um, like feedback on query letters as well? I think so, yeah. Oh, they've cool. got like a whole, both of them have got like a whole range of um services that you can get like packages and you can get written feedback you can get verbal feedback you can get editing you can get all kinds of stuff 
Yeah. And I love to give a free option too. And I think that, you know, a, your writing group, your critique group is a great place to go because it's people who are already familiar with your work or beta readers. Okay. If they're a good beta reader that you've had, like they're going to be, sometimes they're so much better at summarizing your story than you are. <laughs> <Yeah>. Like, <laughs> I'll tell so. you where it's weirdly great for query letters is Reddit pub tips. Have you guys seen? Oh, you, yeah, pub tips. Um, let me double check that that's the subreddit. They do query letter critiques and they're actually really good. Oh, that's okay. awesome. Yeah, yeah. See, yeah. We, we love a free resource around yeah. here too, right? Um, wow. I think it is just pub. Yeah, r slash pub tips. Nice. Um, because I sometimes post on there. If I have time, sometimes I have a quick look at the query letters and comment on it myself. Um, they want me to do an AMA at some point. They asked me to do an AMA, and I was like, "Wait until I sign my first contract, and then I will come and do one because then I will feel like a proper agent." <laughs> 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 so I may pop up on there doing a and ask me anything at some point. Nice. Um, but they do quote. They you can post your query letter, and people will critique it and give good. And, and the advice that I've seen on there has been good. Yeah. So. Nice. Are you good? That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, is there, I'm not sure if anyone else has any other questions for Laura, but um, I think uh, that's everything that I've got listed from everybody. Um, Lucy, Johnny, any more questions? Uh, not that I can think of. Um, no, yeah. very comprehensive chat, Laura. Thank you so much. Yeah. Cal, um, can we find out a bit more about you, Laura? Well, what do you want to know? Well, about the agency, um, if anyone wants to query, have you got any um, submission calls coming up anytime soon? No. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Claire, Claire and I are both swamped. Um, yeah. <laughs> I don't think, if I reopen, it's going to be late in the year, I think, um, because I'm just like... <laughs> yeah um because my toddler I used to get about an hour a day well she's actually started napping again now because she stopped napping and then I had like no time and we put her in nursery one morning a week so I'm just about managing to catch up with things now um Claire has two children and a part-time job and as an agent um we just have like no time yeah <laughs> hopefully later in the year we'll we'll reopen at some point yeah um, follow on Twitter I think you usually post a, a calls for submissions on Twitter yeah. don't you um Claire only accepts writers from the north of England unless it's through um agent one-to-ones or something that she's asked for um I take writers from anywhere in the UK um awesome. when we reopen there you go and then I'll take people from outside the UK if it's someone that I've asked for nice. um just because literally we have to just keep our submissions small because there's two of us and <laughs> you know, yeah. read so much. <laughs> Definitely, quickly get out of hand. <laughs> and um, Lucy, Johnny, thank you so much for taking part. Uh, how can we find a bit more bit about yeah, YouTube as well? Thank you. Um, it's been really interesting chat, Laura. Thank you for your time. Um, so main place you can find me uh, author website is Lucy A McLaren Author dot com, and main place I'm using at the moment is Instagram because Twitter is you know terrible so it's um lucy underscore a underscore mclaren nice johnny hey it was great being here with you uh yeah you can find me i'm on twitter ish new on twitter building that uh <laughs> writing network on there but it's at johnny lee altair j-o-n-n-y-l-e-e-a-l-t-a-i-r so yeah feel free to follow me or find us on the discord fantasy writers tool shed <laughs> yeah yeah and thank you everyone for um, joining us. It's been a really great session. Laura, I've been making notes as we've been going along. It's, uh, it's been fantastic. So uh, thanks very much, everyone. And uh, we'll catch you all soon. Thanks so much. Take care, everyone.